Hello everyone and welcome to the ITSS Verona podcast number series. My name is Luca Mattei, I'm from the Human Rights Branch of ITSS. Today we are hosting uh, Professor Natalie Dobson of Utrecht University on International Law and Climate Change Law. In particular, we will discuss about uh, climate litigations, a perhaps new and emerging phenomenon that uh, we'd like to discuss uh, with this with, with Professor. Thank you for having me here today. It's great to be able to talk to you and a very, very relevant topic, climate change litigation. So, uh, in particular, we would like uh, to understand uh, what are climate litigations, why they are particular. Climate change litigation is, I think, maybe an umbrella term. And then underneath the umbrella, you have lots of different types of cases in lots of different settings. So I would say as a whole, you could see it as an attempt to use the courts um, as, a, as a means to, to increase overall climate protection and action. It may be governments that undertake action and uh, a lot of cases are brought against governments. But we also see a recent um, you know, success, for example, in the, um, the Shell case, where private corporations are also subject to a claim um, and can be found to have climate obligations. What does this mean? I think it's a clear call from civil society um, answering um, a gap in protection, answering a lack of action by governments, a feeling that more needs to be done, and trying to push for that through a different route than just waiting for legislators, but actually having courts push governments um, to take action more quickly. I understand, but um, uh, why in this uh, phenomenon, why the supporters of climate litigation, this is um, uh, my um, follow-up question, let's say, uh, urgenda case, uh, what added do, to this phenomenon? What was the support um, from the society in the Netherlands? I think that Let's take the agenda case as an excellent example. It's, it's um, it was one of the very first successful um, climate change cases, and what they uh, the um, agenda did was they they basically complained that the government had taken on international obligations, and this is an important hook and requirement under the Kyoto Protocol and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, but also under the European Convention on Human Rights. And they claimed that while they had the Netherlands had these obligations, if you look at its actual policy, it wasn't doing enough. It would never be able to meet those targets to reduce greenhouse gases on time. So in order to try and push the Netherlands to take more ambitious natural national regulatory measures, they went to court and they were given they were found to be right in 2015, but they had to go to appeal twice uh, before finally in 2019, right before the end of the Kyoto Protocols period, they were definitively um, winning their case. I see. Um, you talked about the European Convention on Human Rights, and this is uh, the second question, actually. Um, Climate litigation seems intertwined with uh, human rights law. Is this correct? Sometimes. It is a branch uh, of litigation that is proving to be quite fruitful. And now that we have seen the success in the agenda of trying to rely on Articles 2 and Articles 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, we see in quite a lot of similar claims being brought um, in other states. So you mentioned um, in Italy, the Belgium Klimatsak was recently also um, found that could be based on Articles 2 and 8. So they're, they're sort of following the path that was set in uh, Agenda. And we also see that human rights can be relied upon not only in the European Convention on Human Rights, but also in states' constitutions, for example. So not only in Europe, but in other states as well and in other settings as well. Yeah, I heard the uh, fact that um, 
even uh, outside the European Convention, um, there are several uh, climate litigation. I think also in South America and uh, other part of the world. Um, about the third question, which is really, uh, let's say, perhaps uh, it's just uh, um, a prediction, but uh, what will add uh, climate litigation to the ongoing debate uh, on climate change? I think that the debate is being held through the litigators, so they are maybe one and the same thing. Um, and it's also incredibly complex and there are many different questions that are being debated within climate change litigation. I think one of the, um, the questions that arises is what is the role uh, and the division of responsibilities between the legislator and the courts? We look um, at what does climate litigation seek to do. It really puts uh, attention on our traditional separation of powers. Um, and so what we see, interestingly, comparing, for example, the Belgian Klimatsak to the Dutch Agendasak, is that um, in the Belgian case, the they court did not set specific instructions for Belgium to actually reduce um, its greenhouse gas emissions because it said the tension there is too great. We can find that Belgium has failed to meet its obligations, but we cannot tell the government or the, the legislators what to do. And I think this is a question that's going to come back quite a lot in climate change litigation. Can we use this as a route to push policy or will there be other barriers relating to the rule of law? I understand. Well, uh, I think that this concludes this episode and uh, I really want to thank uh, uh, Professor Natalie Dobson for coming and see you soon for the next episode.